Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we're in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, towards the back of your New Testament. And uh, we've uh, begun a series on being like sheep among the wolves. In our little graphic up here, we've got this one sheep standing on this big old rock, and he's surrounded by wolves. For a lot of us, that seems to be what life is. We're walking in a world that seems so opposed to the values, to the, the, the character that we've been told we needed to be. A, a world that's becoming more and more hostile to people of faith, to uh, traditional values, and just like in Peter's day, people are being persecuted for their faith, people are being pressured and forced out of their homes, out of jobs, so much going on, and it's always been this way. We live in a world that simply wants to reject our Savior. And Jesus told us, He's sending us like sheep out among wolves, but we're not defenseless. We are not in danger because the Lord is with us. One of the big things in, in 1 Peter is how the things we have been taught to believe, the, the works of God, the person of God, the rewards of God, all these things working to remind us we can handle what's coming our way. We don't need to despair. We don't need to throw up our hands. And we definitely don't need to give in to the pressures, but instead continue being who God called us to be. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 3 through 5. Would you stand please for the reading of God's Word? 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to re read verses 3, 4, and 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, it is good to know we're in your hands, to know that your promises are forever, and to know that your love endures always. So God, as we face the struggles of Monday, as we face people who just rub us the wrong way, as we look at the future and worry for our children, our grandchildren, remind us, you've got all of this. Your hand is in every ounce of it, and we are going to be all right through it all. We pray for these things in that holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Um, yeah, it's hard out there sometimes. When everything is dragging you down and everything is getting you frustrated and you can't turn on the news, you can't pick up a newspaper, you can't without seeing stuff that just gets your blood pressure up. And then you look around and wonder, are you the only one out there? And sometimes the temptation becomes strong to give up, to give in. Peter is just beginning his letter to some Christians uh, living in what is now modern-day Turkey in Asia Minor and, and trying to let them know the pressures you're under, the persecution that you've been uh, experiencing. Hang in there with it. God has not given up on you. And that message across 2,000 years is still good for us today because the devil hasn't changed. He still wants to drag you down, discourage you, get you to feeling defeated, make you want to give up. But today we're going to talk about, you know, we could be like the wolves. We can howl how lonely we are and how desperate we are and how bad life is. But it's better to hope than to howl. It's better that we've got something to believe in. We've got something that keeps us motivated and moving forward. We don't have to join in with them because we've got something that we've been sent the RSVP for, a spot ready for us. So let's take a look at this passage and see where we can find some hope here. If you're struggling, if you're worried, if you're stressed out and anxious about all that's going on and what November is going to bring this year, you hang in there with the Lord and hang on to your hope. The first thing we want to notice is that there is hope for one group of people. Oh, this is probably the first thing that, that stirs those other folks against us so much. That idea they get in their head that, that we think we're special. Verse 3, 
Blessed be the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Who has hope in this life? You know, we all might have hope of making it to next Friday and having a good weekend. We might have hope of making it to our next vacation. If you've got a cruise scheduled, you probably want to cancel that thing right now with all what's going on. And think about all that. They even canceled South by Southwest up in Austin. What kind of hope do we have in a world like this? Well, there's hope for one group of people. Look what he says. Who, according to his mercy, has begotten us again. If you have been begotten again, if you have been born again, if you have been born from above, if you have had an experience, a saving experience with Jesus Christ, if you know him, you're in that class of people that has hope. It's kind of offensive to some that we would claim that we're the only ones, believers are the only ones, but we didn't make it up. You have a living hope. Who has a living hope? It was brought through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I who believe this, who believe that when a man died upon that cross so long ago, that he had been brutalized by the Roman soldiers, and that the sky grew grew dark while he hung there, The sin of the whole world laid upon his shoulders. And then he gave up the ghost. He died willingly. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he passed. They took him down from there. And then they buried him in that tomb. They stuck him in that tomb. Rolled the big stone across the front of it. Put a Roman guard out there. But come Sunday morning, that stone rolled away. And that tomb was empty and the guard had fled in terror. What had happened? Jesus rose from the grave. And whosoever believes this shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's the group of people who have hope. If you don't have Christ, in fact, 1 John puts it this way, He that has the Son has not life. If you don't have Christ, you don't have this hope. If you don't have Jesus, it's just like the story Scott told, you don't have the RSVP. We all want to go to heaven. In fact, the Bible clearly says it's God's will that nobody should perish, that nobody should be condemned. But then the flip side is, but that everyone would come to repentance. We we don't want to perish, but we don't want to come to repentance. We don't want to admit we're sinners. We don't want to give in and say, yes, God, I am exactly what the Bible says I am. But to whoever understands that we are sinners separated from God by our sin, that because of who we are and what we've done, we don't stand a chance. It's only what Jesus did upon that cross, His death and His resurrection, that give us this hope. So yeah, it's for one group of people, people who have been born from above, people who have been, as it says here, begotten again, people uh, who do not have a dead fading thing, We may be told that, you know, the church is fading away. Churches are getting smaller and et cetera, et cetera. Guess what? God's promise still stands and has not diminished and has not grown smaller. It's still there for you that whosoever believes will not perish. This is there for you. It's there today. And it's founded on a reality, not some pipe dream, not some pie in the sky thing, but the reality that Jesus really did die upon that cross. I got to see that place about three weeks ago. And he really did rise from the grave on that third day. It is a truth that's been attested across the centuries, and many who have tried to debunk it cannot argue the fact. For some reason, the truth of it still stands. Jesus rose from the grave. We base it all on stuff that really happened. Today, as they're telling you that you have no hope, You hang on to the truth that's been taught you. You hang on to what God has said. You hang on to the testimony of people across millennia who have believed in Christ and not regretted it. Across the globe right now, your brothers and sisters in the Muslim world and on the continent of Africa and in parts of Asia and in, in communist countries and places like that, they pay that price nearly every day for believing in Christ. And yet they have found He is enough. He's enough under the threat of loss, imprisonment, and even death. There's hope. And that hope drives them through to stand 
during times like that. That hope is there for you too. You who hope in Jesus Christ, this strength is for you also. And so not only is there hope for this group of people, but you can also find some motivation in this future you've got. As Peter opens his letter, he tells him, you know, don't you guys give up. Because in verse 4, you know, uh, we, we've got a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away and reserved in heaven for you. What keeps us going? Why do you, you know, how many of y'all have ever been in a job that's just a grind every day? You know, well, not me, of course, but um, maybe you all have a job that, oh, you just dread going there. You know, the worst thing about Sundays is Monday, Right? That's your life. I remember those days when I was getting through school and, and, and you know, I worked uh, mowing yards and landscaping and worked for this concrete contractor one time. And, man, I, I hated all that stuff. And there are days you're sitting there, this has been a good weekend. Oh, man, it's Sunday. And you just lose Sunday because you're so bummed out over Monday coming. Because you've got nothing in the future. You've got five days till life gets good again. But you know, for you and me, who have this hope, we've got something out there. Because you know, those Mondays get a little more tolerable when you know at the end of those five days, you got something good waiting. Maybe next week is vacation for you. Maybe next week is your spring break. Maybe, you know, I get through these days and then I'm home free. I remember that last week or so before we went to Israel and, and, and how much I was just thinking, man, four more days, three more days, two more days. How many of y'all think like that sometimes, right? Even if you don't have a job, you're still there. I need to get out of this house. I need to get out of this town. I need, to, I need a change. As the world comes down around us, how do we keep ourselves motivated? Because I know there's something better after this. There's something stronger coming. There is something on its way. I will hang in there. You know, we keep the job because we've got to have that spending money for the weekend. We need to have that money for the vacation. We got to do what we got to do sometimes. But then we find our motivation in that I can do this because I want to get my kids through school. I can do this because I want to be able to pay that car off. I can do this because I want to get to where, etc., etc. For the Christian, we've got an inheritance, we've got something out there, we've got a payday coming. As we face bills, as we face corruption, as we face the overwhelming odds stacked against us on every side, what keeps us going? There's a payday coming. And, and, and look what he says. We've got a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. And look how this inheritance is described. It is incorruptible. It doesn't spoil. It doesn't have an expiration date. It doesn't, you know, like my IRA suddenly use a whole lot of money just in one month. We've been there, haven't we? But nothing contaminates it. Nothing can destroy it. It is undefiled. It's not bad money. It's not going to get eaten by moths. It's not going to fluctuate with markets. This inheritance we have is not going to be a case of where, man, I thought we'd have gotten more than that. Oh, no, it is undefiled. It is pure and then it is eternal. This inheritance we have doesn't run out. You know, the, these professional athletes, they get them big multi-gazillion dollar signing bonuses. And, you know, you and I are thinking, man, a million dollars, look at all I could do. And these folks can go through it in a month. You and I probably could too if we were given the chance. But isn't it amazing that some folks can just, they, a, a, a spendthrift, and, and, and whenever you come into money, you know, it never seems to long as, it lasts as long as you expected it to. But here we go. This inheritance is eternal. It does not run out. It does not expire. And then, get a load of this. It's reserved. That RSVP, yeah. That RSVP he's talking about is simply saying yes to Jesus. Saying, yes, I believe you died upon that cross. Yes, I believe you rose from the grave. And no matter what kind of storm is coming against us here, it is not going to take that away up there. Maybe you've made a reservation before and due to the wonders of technology, by the time you got to the hotel, they'd lost it, right? 
Look at this. This is Jesus Christ. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't lose things. Your inheritance is not only incorruptible, undefiled, and eternal. It's reserved in heaven for you. Yeah, I love it when you go to one of those banquets, one of those parties where they, you know, your name's on the table. That's where you're supposed to sit, you know. Because, you know, I, then you don't have to an answer that question. Where do you want to sit? I don't know. Where do you want to sit? No, man, we got names right over there, right? That's our spots right there. And we're going to go sit there because it's reserved for us. Scott tells a story about that lady going to the banquet. I remember we got to take a cruise several years ago. I thought that cruise ship was a whole lot like heaven because the food just didn't stop. And everything was clean. And, and, and once we got on board, it was like I have never had a vacation where I didn't have to worry about something. Because, you know, I'd done spent the money I was going to spend. Everything was reserved for me. And uh, it just kept coming. The good time. It was wonderful. How much more is heaven? How much more is what God has for His people? That whatever risks we're undergoing, we have brothers and sisters across the world that they see that incorruptible, undefiled, eternal, reserved inheritance waiting for them, and they are willing to put up with anything, even death, because it keeps them going. They found something real out there. This hope, this inheritance, it motivates them because they know that whatever men do to them, they just walk into glory. Do you have that hope? Do you have that conviction? We got the songs that sing about it, but do they sink down deep? That I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. That whatever comes my way, they can't take that away from me. Everything may collapse around us, but we still got that. And it's reserved in heaven. Love that phrase. In heaven for you, for me, for us. And so in light of all that then, we can relax. It may not be going our way. Hard times are going to come. When I say relax, I don't mean just do nothing. I'm just saying this. Let Him be God. Trust Him in all the stuff coming your way. So relax in His security. Because really, isn't that what we're ultimately saying in these times when marriage is attacked, where family values are under attack, where the education system has gone haywire, where so many things, uh, it, just, it seems like this is not what we signed up for. But then we stop and we relax because, you know what, I don't know what kind of chaos the devil is trying to create here, but ultimately my God is going to win. When we sing, a mighty fortress is our God, I've always loved that line, and he must win the battle. There is no other outcome possible than that God would win this. Look at verse 5. That thing is reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through, their, through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at that. We are kept by the power of God. That once saved, always saved thing. We know we got it. Yes. But I am kept in God's hands by His power, not by my obedience, not by my trying my good to outweigh my bad, not by going to church. I am kept by His power, not mine. I reached up and said, Lord, help me, and He answered me. And the fact that 50, 40, 50 years, man, how old am I getting? 40 or 50 years later, however old I am, He's still holding on to us. He has not let go for a second. Through all the ups and downs and failures and victories, through everything, we still have him. Those guys in the Middle East facing imprisonment, beheadings, firing squads, they are kept by the power of God. Even in those moments, they are kept by the power of God. As your world feels like it's turning against you, you remember your God is keeping you, guarding you, holding on to you. Well, does that mean that firing squad might not shoot me? Well, maybe not, but if it does, he still got you. That inheritance, yeah. 
We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. See, in other words, there's a neat thing about when we talk about salvation. There's the thing of, you know, I was saved. We saw a young lady who, in the month of January, made her profession of faith and was baptized this morning. She was saved, maybe back in January, we would say. She's still being saved every day of her life because Jesus is working in her, he's working in me, and he's making progress. We're becoming more and more like him. And one day, we shall be saved in that great day when Jesus comes back and there'll be no more sin dragging us down. This is what he's talking about, about that salvation revealed at the last day. It's bad right now and it's going to get worse. And then it's going to get better. We're going to be desperate. You read the book of Revelation, and I mean, it's kind of like God's in some kind of action movie where he lets the bad guys pile up, and they're winning, and they're winning, and they're winning, and God's looking at his watch, and he says, okay, now, and Jesus comes. And they all mass against Jesus, and they're done when he opens his mouth. And the sword, which is the word of God, comes out of it and leaves them all in a pool of blood. The point is this, he's going to win. That day is coming. The loss, the pain, the grief, it's weighing down on us right now. But all of us, we may fall into struggles. We are not going to lose this relationship with him. In our Baptist faith and message, which uh, is basically the expression of what most of us believe as Southern Baptists, it says this, believers may fall through sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, that means the Holy Spirit, and impair their graces and comforts. That means we kind of messed up a really good thing, that God was blessing us, and we're kind of messing that up a little bit. We're not experiencing His blessing and comfort. Whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comforts, and bring reproach on the cause of Christ, because our mistakes kind of embarrass Him, the things we do. And temporal judgments on ourselves. That means sometimes the consequences of our actions come down on us. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This doesn't mean we can go out and do whatever we want to and get away with it. This means no matter how bad it gets or we get, God doesn't give up on us. Does not let go of us. We call this security of the believer. We say once saved always. We are kept by the power of God. What does that mean for you and me? Oh, anxiety, where is thy sting? Oh, stress, where is thy victory, one guy said. And that's really what it means to be walking in Christ like this. I wonder what kind of world my kids and grandkids are going to have to live in when they get to be my age right now. But you know what? As long as they're kept by the power of God, I think they'll be all right. I worry about what's going to happen to our country in the next few elections. But I've got a God who raises kings up and takes them down. Same goes for presidents, congressmen, mayor, and city council. I'm okay with that. If God deems fit for our sins to raise up a king or a president or a congress or whatever that's going to make life miserable for so many of us, maybe that's the consequences of our action. It does not mean God has abandoned us. It definitely does not mean that God lost an election. God does as He pleases. God does with what's best for us. So we don't have to stress all these things because circumstances do not determine our standing with Him. If we are persecuted, it's not because we did something bad. Let me tell you something. If, it, it probably about it, Within the next 20 years, they're probably going to start shellacking churches with property taxes and making us pay just like that exorbitant fee noises county tax on your house. They'll start doing that with nonprofit properties. Does that mean we're done? No. We may change, but we're not done. There may come a time where what you believe is no longer to be spoken publicly. Many attempts are being made to force us to do same-sex marriages and such things. Does that mean we give up? No. We stay who we are. If that involves persecution, imprisonment, whatever else, well, what else are we supposed to do? We cannot abandon the Lord who doesn't abandon us. We've got a home in glory land. 
We've got a God who's hanging on to us. And the security of our salvation can anchor us in this changing world. Maybe we need to change our music. Maybe we need to change our pews. Maybe we need to change the carpet. Maybe we need to change a few things around here. But you know what? Our God doesn't want us to change what we believed about Him. And come what may, He still keeps His people. That inheritance, remember how it's incorruptible, undefiled, eternal, and reserved? They can't do anything about that. How can we fear what men would do to us? Our Lord has done great things. To battle our doubts, to battle our distractions, take a look at the hope you have. That hope that comes from your simple faith in Jesus Christ and what He did on that cross and in rising from the dead. That hope that comes because God has made it clear that there's something for us in the beyond. And that hope hangs on because we know He never lets go. What are we going to fear then? You've got a God who's on your side. As we've said in the past in our scripture readings, you know, if God's for us, who's going to be against us? Take heart, Christian. As times get darker, we need to speak up and speak out. We need to be who we're called to be. But don't think for a minute, if your side loses, that God lost. Your inheritance is still there. Your hope is still there. Your salvation is still there. This is what He's done for us. As a man living in the midst of persecution, you and I can't even imagine, Peter reaches out to people, and just like we said last week, he started with taking a look at the character of God, and then he comes, now let's take a look at, at what this salvation has brought you, what a relationship with God has brought you. We don't need five quick, easy steps for surviving the apocalypse. We need Jesus just to hold our hands. That's what it comes down to. Maybe today for the first time you're realizing this. That right now you want to reach out and grab His hand. That right now whatever trial, tragedy, trauma you're going through, we're at telling you right here, let Jesus come into your life. He makes a difference. He gives you peace. He gives you strength. He gives you all this stuff we've talked about this morning that we can face it. Right now where you're at, you could pray from the depths of your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know when you died on that cross, it was for me, taking my punishment. I deserve that punishment. But you took it. I want to leave my old life behind and follow you, Jesus. Please, I believe you rose from the grave. Come into my life. Praying that just from the depths of your heart. Saying it to him and meaning it. Is that you today? If you want to do that, we're going to pray here in a minute. I invite you to pray with me in your own heart while we're praying. And then I want you to say, you know, i got to tell somebody. Come and tell me. We're going to sing a song after we pray. I want you to come and tell me if you prayed that or that, that you're ready to call on Christ and have Him come into your life. Maybe you're ready for that. Maybe you're like the young lady this morning that, wanted, that baptized. She did that to tell you what Jesus did in her. That just like he died and rose from the grave, her old life has died and she has a new life with him. Would you like to follow him in baptism? Maybe you're already a Christian, baptized and on your way, but you feel like God's led you to Travis Baptist. Maybe you'd like to come and, and move your membership here. We'll do all that while we're doing this song in a moment. But first, let's pray. Let's bow our heads together.